Father's Day. Caleb, now we are being uh, told or it's being suggested that uh, we can't trust Trump and because we can't trust him, we should be looking to corporate CEOs for moral guidance. This is one of a million different novelties in our culture. Let's start parsing this because you had some really interesting stuff in your piece. Sure. Yes. Uh, it, it really is interesting when, I mean, for the longest time, the left, it was the 99 percent and the 1 percent, the workers against the bosses, the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat. But now we're supposed to rally around the billionaires in the boardrooms against the Donald. Uh, right. He's, he's, uh, he, he's not a good example. And we need to look up to Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos and these great billionaire CEOs. You know, they're setting a good example and showing our young people how to be politically correct. And, and that, that man in the White House is just no good. Uh, this is a pretty strange narrative. It's not the leftism that I'm quite familiar with. <laughs> you know, they've been uh, feeding us that stuff for a good long while in one form or another, albeit at an entirely different scale. Um, you had, uh, you had uh, both the uh, Ross Perot phenomena, for example, um, you had the image of uh, Nelson Rockefeller up until uh, Attica, perhaps, as uh, some sort of benevolent billionaire, you know, liberal that, uh, you know, kept the Republican Party, you know, closer to the center. You had, uh, what, what's his name, Warren Buffett that, um, you know, was trotted out from time to time, uh, all by, you know, people on the center left as, you know, these are places to go. You know, they're re- reasonable, enlightened people. But now it's the... It's it's like anybody but Trump in every sphere of uh, you know of our life. Well, it seems to not occur to some people that among the ruling elite of the USA, among the rich people that have the power, the billionaires and the monopolists, the people in the government, the people in the corporations, that they may not agree with each other, and that that they're not all on the same team at the same time, and that sometimes there may be divisions among them and differences about strategy and differences about how they want to operate. Um, I mean, that seems pretty basic that, you know, they, they, they're not all conspiring. They don't all have the exact same agenda. Um, and, and when that happens, when they're fighting among each other, often they'll try to use ordinary people as kind of pawns in their fight. And it seems pretty clear that the majority of the rich and powerful in the U.S. don't like Trump. Some of the rich and powerful certainly do like Trump. I mean, no, no question about it. The right. folks at, at a lot of the fracking companies really care a lot for Trump and really like him. Uh, I'd say, you know, I've, I've heard that the Walton family from Walmart, they, they really particularly like Donald Trump, um, or they did. Maybe they don't like him anymore. Uh, but, you know, th- there are divisions among the rich and powerful. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, when we're talking about a class that essentially represents the greediest group of human beings that has ever existed, um, it, it's almost impossible to imagine that they wouldn't be looking at each other's wallets as well, trying to figure out how to get their hands on the money of the guy sitting next to them. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, throughout U.S. history, we've seen these fights take place. I mean, during the time of President Roosevelt, uh, Morgan and the Morgan family, uh, they're the billionaire elites, you know, it's J.P. Morgan, they hated Roosevelt. However, the Rockefellers, uh, they loved Roosevelt. They thought very highly of Roosevelt, and they backed him. Um, and that was a fight that went on, you know, with the, the Morgans tried to unseat Roosevelt. They were backing the America First Committee and backing the, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the Landon campaign and Wendell Wilkie and Father Coughlin, all kinds of efforts to defeat Roosevelt, whereas the Rockefellers backed him up and supported Roosevelt. So, uh, you know, th- these divisions go on. Um, I mean, you can go down and, 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 for example, I think one of the biggest divisions we see within the government when you talk about the deep state is the Pentagon versus the CIA. After the Second World War, the Pentagon and the CIA had very different strategies about how the the big business and the the Wall Street monopolists would rule the world. And the CIA's strategy developed at Yale and Harvard and places like that is to try and be Mr. Nice Guy, you know, and look nice up front, negotiate while you have the CIA in the back room, you know, staging color revolutions and assassinating people, but try to look like you're just the benevolent, kind power. Whereas the military, their strategy is strength, you know, shock and awe, blow them up, demoralize the enemy with huge bombastic military attacks. And those two strategies don't work very well together. You can't be Mr. Nice Guy and be killing millions of people in Vietnam with with, with bombs, you know. And so that fight played out very well. I think the death of Kennedy probably had a lot to do with that division Mm. in, in many cases. And, you know, and there were times during the 1960s where there were sections of the establishment that were blatantly supporting the anti-war movement because they thought the Vietnam War was hurting the image of the United States. You know, so it's these divisions are key. 
And you can't just ignore these divisions and you can't just say, well, you know, I, I want to be independent of it. I mean, you have to pay attention to them. You know, if, you, if you're if you're struggling for justice and you want you want the, the people to be represented, you should pay attention to divisions in the enemy camp. I mean, that's just that's just kind of common sense. And I don't understand why people want to assume there seems to be this assumption I continue to hear that all the billionaires, all the elites are for Trump. And, uh, and and the movement against Trump is just this glorious people's uprising, people in the streets, you know, do you hear the people sing Les Miserables? I mean, come on, come on, <laughs> folks. You know, the thing that really concerns me, uh, the division that really concerns me is the actual uh, division in the working class. Because when you see these people brawling in the streets, um, very few billionaires are, you know, getting their head cracked in or cracking anybody's head directly, uh, maybe by agency, but, but not directly. And... Um, you know, there there have been other divisions that are noteworthy in the, the ruling class. Obviously, the national bourgeoisie is over time, the, you know, the main drivers of uh, war, the divisions, you know, among that class, you know, over national division or, or groupings, alliances, etc. But also, uh, we saw play out... Uh, Really, uh, around the time Germany was unified uh, in, in some detail, um, the uh, uh, division between industrial uh, capitalists and finance capitalists. This is something that Lenin wrote about back, you know, almost a hundred years before uh, now. You know, a hundred years ago. But um, it, there is this, uh, you know, group of people that were looking at Russia from Germany, for example, saying, "Wow, we're going to go over there and develop that place and make a billion gazillion dollars." Um, and finance capital with the United States, uh, you know, the firmly uh, in, in that camp saying, no, we're going to take it down and loot it. And you're not going to be allowed to do that. And there was some fighting and even some assassinations that some people credit to th that dispute um, among members of the ruling class at the time. Sure. And right now, um, one of the, the biggest, I mean, we're seeing this play out once again with the new sanctions on Russia which are not just an attack on Russia. Um, it's, it's an attempt to prevent them from selling their natural gas on the international markets. But it's also an attack on the Germans, because Russia and Germany are very close to each other. They're, they're quite close. So buying natural gas from Russia for Germany is a lot cheaper than buying natural gas from the United States. It's just kind of common sense. However, these new sanctions basically twist the arm of the Germans and force them to buy their natural gas from the United States rather than from the Russians. I mean, this is just blatant market right. grabbing. Right. Um, and, and it's costing them, it's going to cost them billions of dollars. And, I mean, this is, this is an attack on the Germans. And you hear the Germans, there's even been talk among some German leaders about possible counter sanctions on the United States in response. That's how angry the Germans are. Mm. Um, and you know, let's, let's remember, you know, that Germany still is occupied by U.S. troops. There's still U.S. troops on the soil so many years after the World, Second World War, you know, after the Berlin Walls come down um, and, you know, as part of the European Union, as part of NATO, a lot of Germans feel like they are really, you know, getting the short end of the stick here. They're being forced to cooperate with this fight against Russia, which is just not in their national interest. You know, uh, the ports uh, in Germany, you know, a lot of the shipping that comes into German ports is from Russian businesses. But now because of the sanctions, they can't take those, those a lot of that. A lot of that um, shipping that, that relates to Russian businesses in German ports can't happen. Port dock workers are losing their jobs all over Germany uh, because not because Germans want it, but because the British and the United States can't stand Russia. I mean, that's not good for Germans at all. And you, you, the entire EU really is suffering from that, uh, with Germany being the engine of the EU, uh, Britain on its way out, and the United States having no formal role. Uh, you know, German dock workers losing their jobs are EU workers losing their jobs. Yes. 38% of the natural gas that's imported to the European Union comes from Russia. And during the debate in the lead up to the sanctions being put on Russia, Tim Ryan of Ohio, uh, a congressman, he basically said, we need to get, get our gas to our allies in Europe and make sure they're not buying Russia's gas. Blatantly. Says it in the congressional record. This is about grabbing markets. Uh, this is this is about, about stopping Russia, which is Russia is an oil and natural gas producing country. That's how their economy. That's how their economy got going again. The 1990s was a disaster. The country was being looted and destroyed and wrecked. And then, you know, starting in around 2000, uh, we, the Putin administration came in. Uh, they started defeating the the Chechen insurgents that were backed by Saudi Arabia, and they started, you know, renationalizing and, and pushing Gazprom and Rosneft, uh, a state-controlled gas company and a state-controlled oil company. And they used those to restabilize the market. And that's why they hate Putin. 
That's really what they hate him for, is that he has turned Russia into a competitor with Wall Street. And, you know, you, you got to look at the irony, because the, the witness, the guy who was the big expert that they brought on uh, to talk about against Russia uh, to Congress, the, the, the Senate committee brought to testify, is this character named Bill Browder. Are you familiar with Bill Browder? <laughs> Go ahead, yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, he's our, a hedge tell fund audience. manager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell our audience, definitely. He's a hedge fund manager. This guy was, was a hedge fund manager born here in the USA. He's got British citizenship. He was working with BP and HSBC Bank. Then he was over there in Russia at the time uh, of, the, of the collapse. And he was there with all these British and American bankers looting the place. And the guy is a tax cheat. He didn't pay his taxes. He right. cheated the Russian government out of millions of dollars in tax money. And uh, and so he does that. And then uh, and then, you know, of course, you know, he flees the country along with all the other BP executives. And now he's the expert. And he talks about how he's persecuted by the Russian government. Oh, I'm so persecuted. Give me a break. And it's it's rather ironic, though. And it is particularly ironic that uh, that, that Bill Browder's grandfather was Earl Browder, the Communist Party leader from the 1930s. <laughs> so it's. It's pretty ironic. I mean, and, and I think it just comes with the fact that his family always spoke Russian, so he knew Russian. They spoke Russian in the household, and that's why he decided to go there and make lots of money uh, during the collapse of the Soviet Union. But, I mean, he was one of the people that, that raided it. This is a, a Wall Street hedge fund manager. I wish that our government was tough, tougher on the Wall Street guys, you know? Yeah. The idea that the Putin government is not letting these guys cheat the country and not letting them, you know, cheat their taxes. And, and the fact that, you know, I mean, what, what was Bill Browder doing? He says he was an activist shareholder. So essentially, as Gazprom was developing, the state-owned natural gas company, he was trying to undermine it. He admits he was going around, he was accusing them of corruption. He, he was basically trying to undermine uh, the, the public control of oil and natural gas in Russia so that he could, could make profits off of it and he and the folks at BP could continue looting the country. Um, that's what this is about. Um, this is a fight over oil and natural gas markets. Yep. Yeah, there's some interesting stuff around that too. Uh, with his, he and his lawyer Magnitsky, as, as in the Magnitsky Act, uh, all the stuff around G Gazprom and and uh, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, we're looking in the paper today. Um, I was looking at the uh, Guardian, and there's an article about uh, two characters. I don't like to call them. One is a conservative politician from the UK, and uh, uh, and another character that apparently have manufactured out of thin air stories about uh, investigations into Trump by uh, the grand jury case against Trump that's supposedly percolating uh, at, as a uh, an action of uh, 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 Eric Schneiderman, the New York State Attorney General. And um, a number of things completely fabricated that the report on today, and I saw, I heard this stuff reported like on WNYC and, you know, in the mainstream media here, um, and, uh, you know, all of it alleging somewhere there's this real estate deal that should have happened in uh, Moscow between Trump and Russian mafia. But the guy sitting in, and it turns out to be all nonsense, but the guy sitting in, in uh, Congress testifying to the Senate actually is in bed with some of the biggest Russian mobsters that exist on the planet. Yes, I mean... People seem to forget that Russia is the biggest country in the world, right. geographically speaking, yep. right? Yep. Uh, I mean, this isn't some, like, obscure, third-world, tiny country. And, um, you know, the idea that somebody might do business with them or have friends over there or something, right. it shouldn't be scandalous. And you can, I can, you, can guarantee, you can be guaranteed that people on all sides of the U.S. political spectrum have relations with Russia, do business with Russia, know people in Russia. I mean, it's a big global player. It's a big country, and they, they have a huge impact on world events. And, and this witch hunt, you know, are you talking to the Russians? Are you friends? Are you soft on the Ruskies? I mean, come on. We need to get past this. <laughs> I know. Um, so what, what are some of the things that you're looking at? I mean, you go out and do these man-in-the-street reports on a regular basis uh, with RT, and uh, you've been doing it for, for longer than, than your time there, too. What kind of things are you hearing on the street now that, um, I mean, I see a lot of things that appear to be in the aggregate, like this unique sociological event, you know, or, or you know, this condition that I've never experienced in my life before. Well, yeah. One of the things that stands out in my mind that happened recently that I'll just never forget was I was doing a story about uh, monuments in New York City that are named after slave owners because there's this whole fight around monuments going on right now. 
you know? Right. And so I, I went uh, to different places. I went to Washington Square Park. I asked folks about it. One of the places I went was up in East Harlem. It was Thomas Jefferson Park, okay? And I, I went up to Thomas Jefferson Park, and I asked the people in the park, I said to them, you know, how do you feel about this park being named after a slave owner? Would you like it to be changed? You know, almost everyone in the park was African-American or Caribbean. And I remember there was one guy who came up to me. He said, I don't want to be filmed. He said, but this is a bunch of BS, he says to me. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, he said, I don't care about the name of the park. He said, I want some jobs. I want young people to be able to eat. I'm so tired of this. And he blamed it on Trump. He said, ever since Trump got in, we're fighting about the name of statues and the name of monuments. He said, I want a job. I want my sons to be able to grow up and get a good job and, and, and live on their own and, and get good pay. I mean, this guy was, he was a Caribbean guy. He'd been here since he was 17. He was about 60 years old. And he was furious. He said, I'm so tired of fighting about monuments. I'm so, so tired of fighting about names and politically correct things. I want things to get better for, for people in my neighborhood. I thought that was really powerful and heavy. Yeah. That, and, that, yeah. And I noticed the odd thing was that it seemed like all the people who told me they wanted the names of parks to be changed were all white. Um, and that was pretty <laughs> ironic. You know, and I mean, it was these white middle class liberals are like, absolutely, it should be changed. That's offensive. And I asked people, you know, in the neighborhood and, you know, Thomas Jefferson Park, they're like, yeah, that's pretty bad. Thomas Jefferson was a bad guy. But, you know, it's always been that way. I don't really care. It seemed like the working class folks didn't really care about it. It was more like the upper class urban liberals who tended to be white. They were the ones who were concerned about changing the names of parks. Um, and I thought that was interesting as well. You know, it, it, on top of that, it, that that's also um, part of what you see, at least my experience, looking at some of the protests quote unquote you know the resistance you see it an awful put it this way what white folks seem really overrepresented in that group sure i mean it's it's it is very much a a, a, a middle class mobilization and that you know i mean it, it's true though i mean I, among the trump supporters a, a lot of them are low-income white folks uh you know who side with the police when it comes to black lives matter who don't like immigrants that's true However, you'll notice that among the, the anti-Trump folks who are overwhelmingly white, there are a lot of them who, who, when they're describing a Trump supporter, it's not just about racism. It's not just about bigotry. There is a class, class. bias. Yep. You know, it's yep. kind of like these are uneducated people. They need to go to school and read a book like I did. And they need to take gender studies at NYU so they can learn how to use the proper language. Excuse me. And, uh, you know, and this. There is this very classist thing, and when they start talking about fake news, they're essentially saying if you buy into any anti-establishment ideas, if you think the wars are being waged for the behalf of somebody else, if you think that, uh, that you think that that uh, the government is lying, if you think maybe 9/11, maybe they're not telling you the true story, you're a dangerous person, you're uneducated, and you you're not worthy of respect, uh, and that kind of comes out, and and that's very that's a defense of the establishment when it gets down to it. A lot of the anti-Trump movement is a, a, a a defense of the political establishment against anyone who would challenge it, whether they be far left or far right. And, and you know, they're irredeemable also. I mean, it's not even something that uh, sending them back to school could do. These are deplorables and irredeemables. And, you know, the, the class element is a really important part of it. Um, and, you know, Marxists like myself... You know, we look at this as, um, you know, as an essential part of it, really, um, that, the, you know, class is the driving force of history. That's, I honestly believe that, and I think it's evident. Um, and as they are dividing us, you know, it, it, there was a reconfiguration that Glenn Ford and Bruce Dixon wrote about at Black Agenda Report over the course of the Obama administration. Uh, in particular, they selected the issue of war and peace and sentiment in the black community towards that issue over the over the history, of, you know, the last hundred years or whatever, and that generally black folks in the United States have been much more anti-war and more politically progressive than whites, and that that vector has shrunken significantly, and that uh, black folks in general have also shifted towards. Um, you know, more, you know, or less anti-war position, less progressive position in the last eight years. So I'm wondering, are we seeing a similar phenomenon now taking place among, like, uh, you know, white millennials or whatever, middle class? I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like anti-war sentiments in the U.S. working class of all nationalities are rising. 
Um, you know, people in the USA are, are much more opposed to foreign interventions than they were before. And that some of the tricks, it seems like every intervention, you know, it, you, you remember the Gulf War. In the lead up to the Gulf War, we were told that Saddam Hussein was pulling these babies out of incubators yeah, and right. throwing them down. They, they, they showed that, that woman testifying, the right. famous Naria testimony uh, on CNN over and over and over again. Right. Everyone was crying, oh, we had to go rescue them. Well, they've been trying stuff like that around Syria, and it just doesn't have the same effect. I feel like right. there is a rising level of cynicism in all sectors in the U.S. When we see the mainstream media trying to pluck our heartstrings and saying to us, oh, we got to go to war to save these poor people. we got to do it. we got to do it. You know, put your anti-war sentiments aside. Now is the time. we just got to rescue these poor innocent people. It doesn't work like it used to. And part of that is that they don't have the media monopoly that they used to have. People can Google it. People can find other opinions about things. Um, you know that 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 you know that the, the the CNN cable networks are not the only are not the only voices out there. That alternative media is much more widespread, and that's mainly because of the computer revolution. Um, that they've developed technology to the point that that other perspectives can get out there. Let's not forget that it was the Catholic Church that invented the printing press to print their Bibles, to print indulgences. That's but right. it was because they invented the printing press that the Reformation was able to happen. People started reading the Bible for themselves, yep. making their own determinant. And pretty soon, the people who'd invented it lost control of their invention, and the whole social order was put into chaos. And I think that's the similar situation here, where they, they no longer, they've developed the mechanisms of distributing information to the point that they no longer can control them. And different narratives are out there. And we're at the point where, you know, Zuckerberg, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook, uh, the guys from Google, Eric Schmidt, others, you know, they, they, they feel like they have this little monopoly on spreading information. But that's going to change. Uh, I, I feel like that is going to change. And we should prepare for the fall of Silicon Valley. Uh, Silicon Valley feels like they have this monopoly on, on, on the global information market. That's simply not the case. And, and just like alternative uh, media networks are rising around the world, I think at the same time, we're going to see, you know, alternative computer uh, networking, alternative social media. You can't put the cat back in the bag. Uh, history that's is that. marching forward. Yep. <laughs> I mean, that's uh, and that's in essence the phenomenon that was, uh, you know, uh, identified and uh, and uh, developed uh, in terms of theory by uh, Marx and Engels a uh, hundred and some odd years ago. <laughs> Um, the uh, you know unleashing productive forces in communications like this, um, you know we have all all kinds of uh, you know movement, social movement in response. You know it's been enabled. It's sort of like wiring across synapses that uh, were not previously connected. Um, I'm wondering if uh, the reconfiguration that I was uh, pointing to before that Glenn Ford and Bruce Dixon have described of political sentiment, in other words, the use of, of social media and uh, alternative media forms uh, to go out and uh, propagandize, uh, you know, organize, uh, enlist people in various uh, into various positions. I wonder if we're seeing um, a, uh, a, a sketch of a new um, configuration coming into view that uh, where the, not only is the old order disintegrating, but a new order is being assembled and we can start to identify its general shape. Well, I, I, that's hard to say, and only time will tell. But it seems to me that if you look at the countries around the world that are aligned with the United States, and if you look at the countries around the world that are aligned with Russia and China, there is a difference in the way their economy is set up. Um, now, it's hard. It's not like the Soviet model. It's not like these countries are Marxist, Leninist countries, one party, you know, five year plans. Not exactly like that. But if you look at, you know, say Venezuela, if you look at, you know, Syria, you look at these countries, these countries have economies in which, you know, there is a central plan and which the government kind of dictates production. Now, they have private corporations and private capitalists, but the government and the state really determines what goes on in the economy. Whereas in the West, it's private corporations and profits that determine what goes on. And these are two, you know, very different political models. Even in China, you know, huge amounts of capitalism in China now, lots of big corporations. But at the end of the day, the government uh, makes the final decisions. And this is the only country, China is the only country in the world where they've actually executed billionaires. You know, if a billionaire, there was a mine owner there that was, you know, violating the safety rules, his workers were getting killed, so they gave him the death penalty. Yeah. That would never happen in a Western country. Yep. Um, and, if, and if you look at, you know, the, the, the biggest steel industry, all, half the steel in the world today is created in China's state-owned industry. The biggest telecommunications manufacturer in the world at this point is Huawei, which is a government-controlled uh, uh, telecommunications te cell phone company in China. 
that basically does all of its business with the Chinese military. It doesn't operate according to profits. It's considered a private corporation, but if you look at it, it's pretty much controlled by the Chinese state and operates in, in, in the, within the Chinese five-year plans. And if you look at this, the countries that are opposing the U.S. tend to have economies that are, that are state-controlled and planned, whereas the countries that are run by the U.S. tend to, market, tend to operate on the basis of this market chaos. And, and we see two different social systems clashing. And it's not the Cold War. This isn't Marxist, Leninist, Soviet-style communism versus Western capitalism. It's not that simple. It's kind of Western capitalism versus anything else. Right. It's Western, yeah, everything and else. that's that's the the fight we're facing. And it's not an ideological fight. I mean, the you know the Iranians have their uh, religious Islamic perspective. The Syrians are Ba'ath socialists. The Bolivarians, uh, Bolivarianism, and that's that's their own ideology. Uh, you know, the Chinese Communist Party. They have their way of viewing things. You got Russian r nationalists and Orthodox Christians in Russia, but all of them kind of seem to oppose this this order where markets and profits come before human life, and that seems to be what they have in common. And that's a nice uh, place to start if you're going to start building a new future for people, for sure. Caleb, thank you very much. We appreciate your time.